Good afternoon. I am Mikko Mylikoski, the CEO of Heureka, the Finnish Science Center. At Heureka, we are honored and pleased to organize this event together with Faktabari. Actually, it is hard to imagine an organization that would align more with our mission than Faktabari. Together, we work for scientific literacy in the society. As a science center, Heureka supports schools and the formal education system, but also advocates and invites everybody for free choice learning through engaging and personal learning experiences. As we humans, on an average, spend only some 5% of our lifetime in formal education, it is easy to understand that formal schooling will never be enough for a scientifically literate population. We need also lifelong and lifelike learning. And we are one of the institutions for this kind of activity and endeavor. Two weeks ago, Heureka received its ninth millionth visitor, but this success and popularity is not enough. We wish to broaden participation and reach out to communities that are underrepresented in our audiences at the moment. Two years ago, we chose the concept of science capital as the frame for, framework for our future work. Later this afternoon, my colleague Kirsi Pulkkinen will address this issue more in detail. But I will stop here uh, about Heureka, and I would like to wish you all an inspiring and rewarding webinar with our distinguished speakers. Let me now hand over to Faktabari and Mikko Salo, who will uh, present Faktabari's view on this. Mikko, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you first of all, Mikko, <laughs> for 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 the hosting us, and and this is a really an honor for us. Um, we will have Kari Kivinen soon presenting more the let's say the today's setting, but my role is more to welcome you to the Faktabari. Our point is here to gather like-minded people for a very important mission we have all. Can I have my slides, please? Yes, of course. <laughs> Just as a general introduction, before going to our educational activities, I could tell you a little bit more about Faktabari, turning from fact-checking, purely fact-checking service, to something what we call digital information literacy. Here in these slides you can see also the hashtags for the social media use if you want to contribute to spreading the information on us. Um, how Faktabari sees our information um, environment nowadays is with this type of uh, view. On the, the uh, left-hand side, you will see our screenshot from our website and, and uh, a mobile uh, application or website uh, where you can kind of enter enter the, the world of Faktabar in, in English or in Finnish. But what we try to cover when educating on digital information disorder is the classical uh, information disorders, meaning misinformation labeled here by the traffic lights and the colors. Uh, then the disinformation marked here by this uh, warning sign. And finally, malinformation that is, stream, is uh, symbolized here with this kind of not, not this direction mark. Uh, next to that one, we try to bring it to the digital environment that amplifies our problems, unfortunately, with the um, with, um, with systemic view. And here we uh, refer to the manipulative online environment mostly caused by the, the social media algorithms that we have to take into account when really seeing what is, what are the really the, the challenges to us all, but in our focus especially to the youth who are the heavy users for for the social media 
and exposed to the algorithmic choices. We do it with an uh, uh, traditionally have been doing it with and for educators. So we, as a small NGO, don't have resources to go to the to the students themselves. We try to empower the educators, be their teachers, mostly in our case, but why not parents and and so on, to to link and discuss the matters with the with the younger younger audiences. Here you see some some of our references, the stories you can find on our website um, when actually CNN made our voter literacy program very famous by spreading it through their exclusive reportage on, on, on a Finnish way of handling fake news, as they called it. And um, then we made an example of empowering youth by fact-checking one of their idols, uh, Greta Thunberg, with uh, two prominent Finnish independent a scientist who both in in gross said that that Greta has done her science homework some smaller problems but the overall the sto story was coherent and and worth worth listening and so making her a fact base like idol at least in that famous statement he did she did in 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 EU context 2019 and finally one example is the how we try to help during the or the ongoing let's say infodemics so the information overflow during the current and ongoing pandemic we unfortunately need to still suffer for a while there will be made some materials for the teachers to use and um, in, in, in classrooms as they wish very good. Uh, we luckily don't need to do this all by ourselves. And uh, uh, we really appeal, of course, and, and give our materials for free to anybody for use. Uh, but these are some of the, the references that we contribute. Uh, one of the probably next steps is what we are doing with the European School Net and, and some uh, Belgium and Maltese colleagues within the project called Facts for All, schools tackling disinformation, where we try to empower the school communities, not just teachers, but also the, also the, the parents to discuss and, uh, disinformation, in that case, mostly within the school community. Then, of course, our today's seminar, that we, Kari will talk more, with uh, Jonathan, uh, and, uh, and then uh, in the bigger scale and in Nordic scale, we try to um, liaise our efforts to a new initiative, European initiative, where we have a Nordic consortium uh, to tackle uh, di um, digital, uh, di uh, digital information disorders. And within that project, we are developing further the, uh, uh, inform uh, our information literacy approach. This program is supported with, uh, with, uh, with our partner Citra. But I think uh, with, uh, with further ado, we actually go towards today's session. And this is something we have co-organized uh, co uh, together with uh, the Stanford Expert Group, Teaching Critical and Evaluative Thinking in Science, or more specifically, Jonathan uh, Osborne, Professor Jonathan Osborne, who is chairing the group, and where we try to address how can science education and educators contribute to fact-based public debate and tackling disinformation. The report, the forthcoming report, will be much broader, but this is a kind of angle that links us, links us both. We will be talking about critical reading in digital information environment, and probably comparing and and uh, comparing uh, different cultural backgrounds a bit and, and um, go for this kind of mutual learning in post through societies. In, in, in short, our aim is to gather like-minded projects. So next to Jonathan and the Stanford Expert Group, we have invited two major um, uh, projects called Critical and, and Finsky. 
uh, they will represent themselves and they have they will contribute to the same matter and and we we try to pool our resources and finally we thank once again uh, Heureka for hosting us and uh, our co-sponsors to enable Jonathan's visit to Finland US embassy and the NGO that uh, that Avoinut Keskunt Ry that um, that is behind the behind the, the Fakta Bari. But let's keep in mind, we are doing, doing this for the students, so that's, that should be kept in mind when we, let's say, adults and, and, and older people mostly, mostly talk about that one. Please join the debate uh, with, uh, with the Fakta Bari hashtag, um, and, uh, and uh, you can also retrospective send us email to the to the to the um, email address you can find from our website um, this session during the session we will also liaise to a very important um, uh, session in uh, fight of Finnish science uh, educators in 15 minutes or something like that 20 minutes so that might cause a little delay in the program but we will sort it out somehow in order to make impact and in order to make jonathan's um, contribution especially available to all and finally the session will be also recorded so you can come back to the different parts um, so once again very much welcome to to Fakta Bari. And now I give the floor to Kari Kivinen, who is presenting our digital information literacy, and uh, then the, the next speakers after that. Thank you. Good afternoon from Heureka, and thanks for both Mikkos. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, we could go to my slides now. I will open a little bit uh, what is digital information literacy. And let's start with a very simple thing. If you have uh, any browser or any search engine, Try to put any word there, and you get millions of hits. I did this a few times ago, and uh, with the word vaccine, uh, I got 100, 240,000 million results in 0 0.6 seconds. This is wonderful. Uh, we have wonderful amount of information available for us in any, every pocket, in every device. The real problem is which one of these hits is matching my information needs? Which one of these is something which is valid for me, information that I really would like to find? So that's the real thing. Out of millions of hits, we as individuals, we have the task to ourselves to uh, kind of figure out which is the information and we need skills to be able to do it. So in the, when we are speaking about information, we need a set of skills and abilities uh, to do any kind of search, how to discover, access, interpret, analyze, manage, create, communicate, store, and share information in the digital environment. For that, we need uh, ability to think critically and ability to make balanced judgments about information we use, whether or not the materials under the analysis are valid, accurate, acceptable, reliable, appropriate, useful, or persuasive. And this is very much linked also for democracy and uh, for being an 
fully engaged citizens in a society. There are loads of terms about um, online literacies, and I will explain here a few of them. So, for, first of all, Finnish um, um, curricula has uh, a very broad term called multiliteracy. In the Anglo-Saxon countries, very often it's used media and information literacy, MIL. For example, UNESCO is uh, using this term to flag uh, the media and information literacy. Because we are based on the fact-checking organization, we are mainly interested on how the information part of the MIL uh, can be uh, tackled. And information literacy is developed by librarians a um, long time ago. And if you go to any library in the world, if you are looking for a book on mammals or animals, the librarian will tell you exactly where to find the right information and the right book. Libraries have different kind of systems where uh, this can be facilitated. Now, our library is online. Uh, it's digital. And we don't have librarian telling us uh, which is the right shelf to find the information we are looking for. And that's why we are speaking of specific skills related to online environment, and we call that digital information literacy. There are a lot of other terms like social media literacy, data literacy, algorithm literacy, and it's also linked to the privacy awareness. In this um, conference, you will hear uh, about critical reading, and the European uh, Commission, for example, is using digital literacy. But in the end, we mean the same thing, uh, how to help citizens to find the information uh, which they are looking for. The problem is that uh, online environments and the platforms, um, they are not really made uh, in the purpose that they are facilitating the finding of the information in a transparent way. Because of different types of algorithms, uh, different types of ways the environments are coded, they are made to maximize sometimes commercial interest, they are made to capture and sustain our attention by providing us interesting hints, interesting materials to keep us hooked. Um, they are collecting data out of us, which they are selling for the advertisers in order to predict and influence the future. For example, uh, behavior of buying things on the Black Friday. And I have not yet touched the, the subject of um, mis dis and malinformation. It is challenging to find the information from the online environment because of the overwhelming amount of information. But the problem is that parts partially inside of the correct information, there are misinformation, which is a false information which is shared but no harm is meant, disinformation, which is uh, false information shared um, knowingly to, to cause harm, or the malinformation, which is uh, maybe correct information but it's shared against the person's wish in order to make some damage. And this all is linked to the uh, danger of democracy. Um, because the health of the democracy depends on the people's ability to access reliable information. For example, to be able to vote correctly in the elections. And in the online environment, the traditional gatekeepers uh, are largely absent. For example, in the printed media in Finland, uh, there is a um, quite good ethical uh, responsibility for the reporters, journalists, and also the, for the publishers. But in the online, this is missing in many parts. So what can we done? And this um, slide is taken from the Kosirova et al, uh, Citizen versus the Internet um, presentation. And they have proposed that there are uh, four different angles and intervention corners uh, to, to do something change the laws and regulations, 
publish ethical guidelines. Technology, the technology which is um, used by uh, maybe providing harmful material can be also, also used for other purposes. On the way here, we, we used navigator, and uh, navigators are seldom, the algorithms are seldom, seldom uh, proposing disinformation. Otherwise, people won't use it. Then there is uh, psychological and social science. We need new kind of um, traffic rules on online uh, environment, um, and we should study it much more. And we will hear today two presentations on about the research which is going on uh, at that level. And education, which is close to our heart. Um, how we can uh, improve the school curricula uh, for digital information literacy. If we are starting from the European level, uh, the European Union has launched the Digital Education Action Plan, which is quite ambitious. And for example, I myself, I'm a member of the expert group on tackling disinformation and promoting digital literacy in education. We have had two meetings with 25 experts, and we will publish uh, recommendations, uh, let's say, earliest next summer or next September. Uh, there is um, DITSCOMP 2.2. Uh, for the first time, there are uh, media and information literacy competencies there, which will be proposed uh, for the member states and educational organizations to be applied. It, it will be published in February uh, next year. So there are a lot of things happening on the European level. In the Finnish level, we have already a curriculum which contains um, uh, in a cross-curricular area, uh, multiliteracy, thinking and learning to learn, ICT competencies. So in Finland, the curricula is not preventing us to go deeper into digital um, uh, literacy. There is also a very new, new uh, movement. Uh, it's called uh, New Reading Skills, Uudet Lukutaidot. And you can see the competencies which are starting from the pre-primary, uh, going to the end of fundamental education uh, in several areas. Here is an example of information management, and already on early education, children are uh, kind of familiarizing themselves with the basic use of a browser. And it ends up at the age of 15 when they are students are able to do much more, and they are able to interpret inf information on the net. In fact, about EDU, we have been uh, working with the students and with the teachers, and we have kind of identified uh, uh, 10 different streams where we should uh, work a little bit more. First of all, the online and offline environments are different. Uh, the behavior in the online uh, environment is different. Offline environments, we have mainly printed media, uh, books, uh, magazines, journals, etc. When online information, like I said, there is a lot of materials which are not published by anybody, but they are put uh, forward. Then uh, development, how to uh, promote development of critical thinking skills, strategic ignorance and lateral reading, I will come back to that. We recommend also that invite to schools experts, media experts, researchers, journalists. We will discuss today a lot that science is much more than an opinion and how we could uh, teach students to find out which experts are reliable, which sources are reliable, which articles are reliable. Uh, we have provided different types of um, checklist used by the fact checkers, um, kind of online environmental traffic rules, which Mikko spoke already, how to deal with uh, confusing contents, for example, conspiracy theories, um, to be more aware about algorithms, and then a very important part, how to verify the authenticity of the photos and videos. It's a growing uh, need. And last but not least, how to take care of our privacy and our digital footprint. What do we want others to know about 
ourselves. And because of that, we have created all kinds of materials uh, for teachers and also for students. And we are in the opinion that in spite of the good uh, curricula, there is a huge need for upskilling of our teachers. There is a need for uh, proper tools and methods to deal with the information disorder. And uh, this is something we should take very seriously. We should also continue to promote the critical thinking skills. And uh, this doesn't mean that we are absolutely negative on everything, but uh, it's kind of formulating balanced and analytical uh, judgments about the things we are looking at. And I would like to raise the issue that in our trainings we have had a lot of mother tongue and history teachers or social science teachers, but not really uh, science teachers. And today you will hear soon the testimony of uh, Jonathan Osborne, who will say that actually science knowledge is really needed to tackle this information linked to the scientific claims. Few words about the strategic ignoring. There are so much information online environment that we have to learn to pass by the information which is not really worth reading. And there are different ways of doing it, and I will not go much further to that, but the idea that not all the information is equal on value, it's important, and we should look for the information which is really important for us. And what we can learn from the fact checkers is these kind of lateral reading skills, that instead of starting to jump to the first text we find online, we should fir first check who is behind the information, what is the evidence, and what do other sources say. Um, I would like to uh, warmly recommend the fact checkers against the disinformation uh, uh, database, because this opens the eyes to see how um, disinformation is spreading around the world uh, very rapidly. That um, there is a claim popping out in Mexico, next time in Southern America, maybe going to Portugal, then finally coming to Finland. And in this international database, uh, you can follow the disinformation going from place to place. Um, we will be publishing the sources of our, our presentations. We want to be transparent so that you have time to look at them carefully. You have time to learn, uh, to check it yourself, because we want, don't want you to take granted what we say. But it's better to check it. Um, now the next point will be uh, quite interesting. We will have um, Professor Jonathan Osborne from the Stanford University, uh, who has had, uh, who has coordinated a group of experts from all, the, all over the world, who have been uh, diving to find out how to improve the science teaching uh, in order to tackle disinformation and especially how to tackle uh, the, uh, the disinformation which is kind of uh, based on scientific or pseudo-scientific uh, claims. And we have this uh, pleasure to have a Luma Network uh, joining us in one minute time. So there might be um, a little switch of problem because we are moving from uh, streaming to the other kind of platform, but uh, don't get worried. Um, stay tuned and you will have the uh, continuation. Um, since last uh, January, I have had a pleasure to work with uh, Mr. Jos uh, Professor Osborne and his team. And we, I have had an absolutely pleasure to listen to the very valuable discussions. And the thing I learned from them is that, yes, it's important to promote uh, digital literacy, multiliteracy, uh, different type of literacies. But if we don't have the scientific basics on, on uh, these basic competencies, it's very difficult to tackle uh, the disinformation 
which is using scientific claims. And um, we will hear now, starting from any second, what is going to uh, be the, the presentation of Mr. Osborne. Uh, Mikko, may I ask what is the situation there in the, uh, in the LUMA meeting? We are practically ready to continue as you want. Yeah. So I would like to propose to switch the places with Professor Osborne. Welcome. And I would like to welcome also the LUMA people to listen to this uh, direct sending from uh, Heureka. Mr. Osborne, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, we're ahead? Okay, great, fine. Uh, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for attending online. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be doing this in person, uh, but uh, I'm uh, delighted that you've come to listen to me, and I hope I've got something valuable to say. The basic title of what I'm talking about uh, is, wait a minute, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm calling it Science Education for a Post-Truth Society. And the, the label post-truth, I think, is being used to reflect that I think we're all confronted by a very rapidly changing society where all kinds of in, uh, we are provided with all kinds of information. Basically, we're awash a in a sea of information. And I think the evidence is pointing to the fact that most of our youth have no basic navigational qualifications and you could also say that about a lot of adults as well. And the consequence of that is that they are tending to believe all kinds of things uh, which you are dubious. And uh, there is an undermining of the trust in science. And the responsibility for that must, f or remediating for that, must fall on those who are engaged in teaching science and educating people about science because the failure to do this is to do a disservice to science, and that is, I think, is ultimately to do a disservice to the societies in which we live. And I want to make that kind of argument, basically, and talk about what it is that we can do in science, because I think the kinds of things we can do in science education require some kind of rethinking of what we value. So, okay, who has been involved in this project? Well, basically, this project was initiated by Bruce Alberts, who used to be the editor of Science, He's a leading member of the science community in um, the US. And he basically was worried and concerned, I think, about the way in which science has been called into question, particularly in the recent pandemic with all the issues around vaccines and masks. Uh, and he uh, convened with Janet Coffey from the Moore Foundation, who have funded this work. Uh, uh, well, he asked me to lead a group of people. And this is the list and group of people. It's a mix of people who are engaged in uh, science, philosophy of science, for instance, Douglas Alchin uh, is a philosopher of science. Uh, 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 some of them are um, uh, undergraduate science educators. Carl Bergstrom, for instance, has written a book called Calling Bullshit. Uh, Saul Perlmutter is a Nobel Prize winner who's written a book or developed a course called Sense and si Sensibility of Science. And then, of course, in fact, you have Carrie Kivinen, okay, from a fact, a fact in Finland. And there are other people here. Uh, who are work in science. And we have met over the uh, past six months, basically still in ongoing meetings, to discuss what the issue is, to look at the different kinds of approaches, and to generate some kind of report. Basically, our goal with this is to generate a kind of policy statement for the science education community, arguing why this matters and why we really have to do something about it. And our kind of model for this is previous reports that have uh, come out of the UK. One of them was by Paul Black, uh, my colleague on Intercall Inside the Black Box, and another one is the one that I was involved in called Beyond 2000 Science Education for the Future that some people may know about. So our goal in the next three to four months is to produce some kind of similar report as well, uh, arguing the case for why this matters, because we do obviously think that it matters. Now, in making this case, we have uh, drawn on a lot of uh, what you might call ac academic work. Uh, these are some of the kinds of articles. Uh, Douglas Orchin and Dietmar Hotka's work, uh, work on reconceptualizing the nature of science education. Clark Chin and Sarah Barzilay's work on education for a post-truth world. And the one that Carrie's already mentioned, Anastasia Cosraver and her colleagues on citizens versus the in internet. Uh, confronting digital channels with cognitive tools. I think the thing 
to take note of here is that this, in the past four or five years, has gained a lot of attention because there is a lot of concern about the, out there about the way in which some of this misinformation is undermining what you might call the, the civil nature of democratic societies. And we start from the premise, and I think this is the important premise, that true knowledge is a collective good because basically it enables us to act in an informed way. And therefore it's tremendously important that people draw on what we call true knowledge in making their decisions and informing their actions. The question to be asked, of course, is how do you make sure that they reliably get that? And we have four questions, really. First of these questions is, why is this competence to evaluate expertise and information needed? Uh, you might say that's obvious, but nevertheless, it's part of our argument. Uh, what is the evidence they actually struggle with that? And I'll come to each of these questions in turn. Okay. Why should science education, and those who are science educators listen to this might think, well, this is fine, but it's not really my concern. It's civics education. Why should science education be bothered about this uh, in that sense? And if it should be bothered, our last question, what can be done in science education to develop the ability to evaluate scientific information? Because much of this misinformation has a scientific quality to it. Uh, and uh, to, to do it competently as well. So those are our questions. Um, so let's uh, turn to the first of these questions. Why is this competence to evaluate expertise and information needed? OK, well, I don't really think this needs a very strong argument, but this is the kind of way of summarising it. This is the contemporary challenge. You've seen it extremely uh, prominent and coming to the fore in the past two years with the pandemic. All kinds of competing claims in the community and many of these claims calling on the language of science to try and convince people that they uh, basically are, uh, are capable of making the decision for themselves and that they are in, uh, sufficiently informed uh, and th or that they are being deluded in some kind of way by uh, scientists. So this is the challenge. How do you sort out, in some senses, the wheat from the chaff? How do you make it clear what's trustworthy knowledge and what's unreliable knowledge? And this has been characterized by various reports. This is one of them. Uh, so we are living in an area of truth decay, where truth is less valued than it was. What matters is not so much what you might call objective truth. What matters, in some senses, is what the values and beliefs of the community you have in that sense. Uh, and this has led to the notion of post-truth. So you, out there, you can have, find all kinds of misinformation. This is just a sample of them. For instance, there's still a prominent number, a number of people who believe that the Earth is flat, that ivermectin can cure you or prevent you from getting COVID-19. Moon landing was a hoax. That one's been going on for a long time. Masks are ineffective at preventing the spread of COVID-19 or that climate change is not anthropogenic. And you find that, okay, in all kinds of sources, but particularly this kind of tweets. And some of this, okay, goes beyond what I call misinformation. Um, misinformation is just simply knowledge that's passed on that happens to be wrong. And the people who passed it on didn't know or don't know uh, that it's wrong. Disinformation is spread deliberately uh, for some kind of uh, political or financial agenda in that way uh, for people to make... Uh, uh, profit out of it. And uh, being aware of that distinction, I think, uh, is important. And the situation, I think, in some senses, has got to the point where uh, this cartoon characterises it, the level of concern about it, in that sense, uh, where you can see misinformation as not as the fifth horseman of the apocalypse, in that sense, along with war, famine, pestilence, and death. Uh, you might say that's a, putting it a little bit radically. But the position I think we're in as a group of experts in the community is this is something serious. It is not something that we can pass off and wait to pass. It's something that we have to do something about and not doing something about it okay, is problematic. The question you've got to ask, in fact, then, is what should science do about it? You're in a situation where, in some senses, expertise or the, the value placed on expertise has diminished. This is a very readable book by Tom Nichols, who bemoans this uh, fact. 
arguing things like, I'm still deeply concerned that we are headed into even darker days for logic, reason and knowledge, and consequently the kind of reason debate that sustains democratic societies. And this is, in some senses, a very, uh, what could you almost say, irony, because actually we're living in societies which are more and more complex, where are dependent on more and more specialist knowledge. We are all intellectually dependent on experts. Every time you basically go out there on the road, get on a train, get in a plane, you are dependent on people who know things you do not know that enable that system to run. That's just transport systems. Think about health systems. Think about energy systems. Okay? All of us depend on the experts who run those kinds of systems. And what you're seeing emerging, I think, is a concern about this in a range of books, Science Under Fire by Andrew Jewett, a book by Gloria Origi on reputation and how basically people make judgments on the basis of reputation rather than evidence, and Steven Pinker's book on rationality, what it is, why it seems scarce and why it matters. Those are some of them. And the responses to that, in some senses, are books on courses organized by people like Carl Bergstrom, who is a member of our group on Calling Bullshit, uh, Sam Weinberg, who is also a member of our group, colleague at Stanford on Civic Online Reasoning. Do look them up. They've got, uh, uh, and, of course, the, the work done by Fact of Ari on fact-checking for educators and future v voters. That's some of the work in that sense. And then there is also a very long and lengthy response published recently by the uh, National Academy of Education on civic reasoning and discourse. They, too, are concerned about it. That's a very academic treatise on it, but it's downloadable, and obviously it goes into this issue in some depth. Okay, so that's I think, is a kind of argument for why it is that this is an important issue. Okay. I'll get to the issue of why it matters for science education in a moment. What, uh, briefly, I want to try and answer this kind of question. What evidence is there that students struggle to evaluate information successfully? Because I think a lot of us think, well, these young people, they're growing up in this kind of sea of digital media all the time. Every time you get on any piece of public transport or if you're in a family, they seem to be fixated or hooked to this. Surely they're acquiring this expertise en passant or they're learning from each other. Would that it was so. Sadly, that is not the case. Because the research evidence is that students are poor at evaluating sources of information. They make what you might call fundamental basic mistakes. They think, for instance, that doc if his site's got doc.org on it, it's a reputable website. I'm sorry, but nothing could be further from the truth. Some dot.orgs are reputable, and some dot.orgs are simply disreputable. And that doesn't help you as a criterion for discriminating. They tend to evaluate the page. So they start by looking and reading the page and seeing what kind of information is it. Uh, and they get duped, many people get duped, into thinking that they are capable of doing that and that they will understand the evidence in that kind of way. This is the wrong thing to do. Expert fact checkers do not stay long on the page. They open another tab and check out the source and check out what they can find out about that source of information. And only when it passes those tests do they come back and look at the page itself and start to evaluate the evidence. So basically, that is the a priori ability that competency we must teach. They also tend to use reputation as the basis of epistemic trust. They trust something because it came from their friend, or they trust something because it came from a community that they're engaged in. And they distrust things that come from people that they don't know. That is not the criterion you should be using to establish trust in science. Okay. The criterion you should be using to establish trust in science, I'll come to shortly, uh, uh, are something that you need to know about and to be taught. And the last point, as I point made, you need these because we are epistemically dependent. We ha all the time, we have to make judgments are based on our trust in expertise. For instance, I suspect most of this audience, in fact, I hope all of this audience, believe that climate change is an anthropogenic effect. Next question I will ask you is, how many of you have actually read the evidence? And I suspect if you're like me, you haven't read the evidence, and your trust is based on something else. Okay, this is another piece of evidence to show that uh, the problem, 
This comes from Sam Weinberg's research. Uh, and it just, I think, illustrates it. As researchers have shown, such claims despi persist despite the 2019 national survey of 3,446 high school students that revealed major deficiencies in evaluating the credibility of online sources. 52% said that a Facebook video claiming to show ballot stuffing during the 2016 Democratic primary elections, a video that actually came from Russia, a fact easily established by searching for a 2016 voter uh, fraud video, constituted strong evidence of US voter fraud, yet nine out of 10 students were unable to come up with a cogent rationale for rejecting the video. And that's posing a threat to our democratic societies. And it, that, I think, is a basis of the concern that most of us actually have. So this group considered this and said, well, what are the kinds of issues that mattered? Uh, and how, uh, if these are the issues that matter, what can we do about them? And basically, we came up with this list, uh, essentially, of things that we thought were important. Digital media literacy, the kind uh, of things that uh, Carrie's talking about. Valuing truth. Uh, that, I think, is something which we have to imbue into science education, that this is an important value. An understanding of uncertainty, uh, the role of expertise in making judgments, the kinds of errors that we all as humans make when we reason, and we do make them commonly, uh, how you establish credibility in a source, uh, how we establish reliability and trustworthiness of scientific knowledge, what uh, cons consensus is in science, how it's achieved and why it matters, and then this kind of social and collaborative nature of science. And basically what we're arguing for when we come to our third, answering our third question uh, is that there needs to be a much more of an emphasis on the social structures in science that enable it to produce trustworthy knowledge. So, <clears throat> going on. Why science education? Uh, why, why can't this be done somewhere else in civics? Well, first of all, many of these issues are science-related. Uh, and if they're science-related, there's a kind of obvious inference that the context in which they should be discussed and how they should be decided should be in the science lesson. And science education, okay, has a duty and responsibility, along with all other disciplines, to develop the competency to do this. You might say, okay, that in some senses, well, it's in competency is important, but you can't wash your hands of it and then say, we don't need to do anything about it. Because you're making an assumption that somebody else is doing about it, something about it, and you're making an assumption that they understand enough of what the, science, science, the social structures of science are to be able to educate their students. And I don't think they do. Because much of the information that's needed is essentially uh, science-specific. And these are the kinds of issues that you need to understand in coming to a judgment about a science-related claim. First of all, you need some kind of evaluation of science expertise. Who is this person or who is this body that is making this claim? In what sense are they, you might say, a benevolent source who are, is interested in advancing your understanding of the truth? Or are they offering you what you might call a distorted version of the truth? You need to understand some, some of the ways in which scientific knowledge is constructed and vetted to minimise error. That means some understanding of what actually is quite a complex process peer review, but at least a minimal understanding of how it works and why it matters. Most of all, though, you need some understanding of the importance of scientific consensus. Science is not a democracy where all voices are equal. What happens in science, basically, is that findings around a question accumulate over a period of time, and gradually, in fact, as more and more findings emerge, and that they all are saying the same kind of thing, scientific consensus emerges. And if there's a scientific consensus, if somebody's calling that into question, they can legitimately call it into question, but it's really, in fact, they're putting themselves uh, you might say, beyond the boundary of what all other scientists think, and they may, the, whether their information should be credible is highly questionable. And you also need to have some kind of understanding of the role of error in science. Science does make mistakes, but it's also got these self-correcting mechanisms for eliminating error. So these are the kinds of things, and that, I think, answers my question. 
Those kinds of things should be taught in science. Where else would they be taught? And therefore, we as a science community have a responsibility to do that. The other things I think in some senses, the last thing I say is important, is that we need to build some kind of sense of intellectual humility. Many of the ideas that we put forward in science are enormous intellectual achievements, just from the idea that day and night is caused by a spinning earth. After all, if you look out the window, it's patently obvious that the sun moves, to the idea that you look like your parents, because every cell in your body carries a chemically coded message about how to reproduce you. Now, these things didn't emerge overnight. They weren't the result of some kind of simple experiment. They were a result of years and years of thought and hard work. And when confronted with scientific claims, that needs some kind of understanding of what's gone into it in that kind of way. OK, so what can be done in science education then to develop the ability to evaluate scientific information and expertise competently? And this, is, I think, is obviously... Uh, you might hopefully come with me to say, well, OK, maybe science education should do something about this. But what can we do after all? We've got enough on our plate already. The curriculum's absolutely full with, with too much. Well, I agree science curricula are full with too much, uh, and that is an issue which science curricula have, I think, failed to deal with in what you might call a coherent manner for a long period of time. Uh, and all I am doing, I think, uh, and I think legitimately doing, is saying, for once, you really do have to think about this because your failure to do anything about this, if you're involved in science education, is a failure to science. And scientists out there themselves have to do something about it because they are worried about the lack of trust in science. So these are the generic kinds of things that we can teach with simple exercises over the, over the years, one of them is lateral reading. This is the idea that when you land on a page, okay, what you have to do, or if when, you, when, you, or when you click restraints to the other thing, when you do put a question into Google, you get a list of sources. Uh, what the sources you get depends upon what question you put in. And therefore, okay, the thing that comes at the top isn't necessarily the, the best thing to answer it. So expert fact checkers do not click on the one that comes at the top straight away they read through them looking for the one that actually might be the most useful before they click. When they get onto that page, they don't spend long on it because the first question they're asking is, is this source trustworthy? And therefore, they leave the page and do searches looking at the source and seeing what they can find out. They use, for instance, Wikipedia to establish whether there is a scientific consensus. Wikipedia is good when there is a... a significant uh, uh, issue which lots of research has been done on. So look at the issue obviously of masks, look at the issue of climate change, Wikipedia will give you good answers uh, to uh, your questions on that. They use fact-checking websites, Snopes.com, Sourcewatch.org, which spend, have professional fact-checkers in that sense and they'll use those to check out uh, sources. And the reason you need to do these strategies rather than some of the existing checklists that exist. Uh, there's a notorious one in the US, which goes by the uh, uh, interesting acronym of CRAP, which stands for Currency, Relevance, Authority, Accuracy, and Purpose. And the research evidence shows that if you use that, you'll still be deceived by duplic duplicitous information. So we have to educate students in these techniques. Those are the generic techniques. What do we have to actually do in science? These are the things we have to teach them about. We have to teach them about the importance of scientific consensus. Science puts a premium on intersubjective agreement. When there's a consensus, okay, basically science moves on saying it has established knowledge beyond doubt. It doesn't mean that it may not be called into question, that it can, can be called into question, but basically the, over, the body of evidence is so overwhelming that nobody's really calling it into doubt any longer. And that you need to understand. So one lone voice in the wilderness calling into doubt okay, is not really worthy of your attention. Ten lone voices in the wilderness, then it gets a little bit more interesting. But, but in that case, there's not a consensus. And if there's not a consensus, then in some senses the best thing to do is to keep an open mind uh, in that kind of way. 
uh, as um, Christopher Hutchins uh, said, uh, that can, which, which can be asserted with evidence, without evidence, can also be refuted without evidence. And so evidence is tremendously important, and the consensus of evidence is tremendously important. You need to have some understanding, as I said, of peer review, and the mechanisms of vetting by peers which go on. This is uh, quite important. You need to have some understanding of scientific expertise and what it means to be an expert. And in particular, you need to understand that somebody who is an expert in one discipline of science, for instance, radiology, is not an expert in epidemiology. And therefore, they have no legitimate expertise to question other scientists outside their discipline. This is tremendously important because this technique of calling science into question using scientists who have no expertise in the discipline has been used by the tobacco industry, by the oil industry, uh, uh, and um, I can't think of the, uh, and the uh, climate change deniers, okay, as well. And you need to understand that. There are other people who have other relevant expertise because they work in the field, they midwives, okay, uh, from that point of view, or farmers or fishermen. They are people who have expertise built out of experience they could be listened to. But these are the things that uh, you can teach in science. More specific science elements. We need to attend to the teaching about uncertainty. Uncertainty is an intrinsic feature of science. And nothing, we can never be absolutely confident about anything, but science has ways of minimizing uncertainty. From the very basic stuff of taking averages to the much more complex stuff of doing statistical measurements about probabilities. There's a distinction between cause and correlation, and you need to be wary about those two and how those are abused, and we need examples of, of their abuse. And then there are these errors in human reasoning that we make, uh, particularly confirmation bias is one of the things that we look for sources that confirm our views, and we don't look for sources that challenge our views. That would be true about, I'm afraid, a lot of politicians as well, but it also happens in science. Intellectual humility is something I'm, uh, I, I can't just, I really just want to whip on, and I, uh, I uh, will not read that long quote from that point of view. Uh, but I think the main point I want to make here is that there is a distinction between knowledge and information. Information is something you can get out of Google. Knowledge is something you need to understand it. Knowledge is based on a coherent network of interrelationships that you understand. And that is built up over time. And yes, that's something that science education attempts to achieve, but there are limits to what we can do in the time that we have. And that you need to be aware of that distinction and have some recognition of the fact that we are flawed as human beings, we make mistakes, and therefore we should not believe things without evidence. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide, I'm afraid, because of the time, but this is a problem in the American uh, uh, curriculum, uh, which obviously doing this work in America, we do have to refer to that from that point of view. But I think this is also true to some extent of other curricula as well. So let me come on to um, finish with the policy implications. Uh, uh, and I need to be blunt about this, I think, in some senses. The things I've been arguing for are tremendously important. They are the competencies that all citizens and all scientists require. And because they're important, I argue that they have to have priority over teaching things like Ohm's law, the chemical structure of benzene, or the distinction between chromosomes, chromatine, and chromatin. Those kinds of pieces of information are unlikely to be useful again ever in your life unless you happen to be a practicing science in that, scientist in that particular discipline. The things I'm talking about will be basically useful for the rest of your life. And if that means sacrificing some of what you might call the, the shibboleths of uh, current science curricula, so be it uh, in that sense. It means, I think, from a policy, you, science education needs to try and offer a more social perspective on science, uh, how it functions as a community. Uh, that's something which it f uh, fails to do at the moment. Uh, it needs to put flesh on the bare bones of what is practice ache in the next generation science standards of obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. That is not done well. Uh, in the next round of PISA, there will be a new competency called research, evaluate, and obtain information for decision-making and action. And this is something that will be assessed in PISA. Uh, and it's clearly something that any next iteration of standards hopefully should attend to. This is the argument that we're trying to make. Uh, it means uh, educating science teachers about uh, what, it, what needs to be communicated and why it matters. Uh, I mean, all of what I'm saying basically uh, 
will fall on stony ground if somehow or other it doesn't get through to teachers that this is something that needs to be done. It means a focus on error, uh, and that means, I think, a, sh a shift in assessment. Rather than getting students to reproduce the right answer all the time, we need to get them questions which ask them to spot the flaw, spot the error in this particular piece of reasoning. Because only by doing that do you, I think, get people to be more circumspect about lots of information that they're actually getting. So that's a rather kind of brief run-through about this kind of report that we're working on. I think many of you might have seen a summary of it. Uh, we are hoping to produce the full thing with a much more extended argument uh, in the next three months, and I will um, offer it for a wider circulation there. But I'm very happy to answer any questions, uh, and I hope I've given you a sense of what the work we're doing is and why I think it matters, and hopefully you think likewise. But I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Jonathan. It was very, very interesting, very important. And I would like to pass the message now to the Luma people that if you want to follow um, the, the follow-up, we are continuing the broadcasting here from Heureka. There will be uh, Karita Kili from the University of Tampere presenting the critical group uh, findings and approach. And then Kirsi Pulkinen from Finski, who is going to uh, promote that. You can find the link uh, from the chat, and if you don't go to that, go faktapari.fi, and you can see that there is a, a, a window which you can click and you can con continue. So, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I have one question to you. All right. You said three, four months. Yeah. Uh, we have been working with the report quite a long time. Yeah. What is still to come? What do you uh, expect? What kind of recommendation add-ons? Because this was already a quite heavy uh, message. Yeah, I don't, I don't think what comes out of it, the recommendations will be fundamentally different. I think what will come out of it, it will be a much more uh, detailed argument for why these things matter. So uh, as a group, you can imagine, uh, and particularly a kind of group of experts like this, uh, we uh, have lots of... I think not disagreements about the main messages, but disagreements about the tenor, the, the kinds of reasons, the rationales, what things are put, uh, are given preeminence or less preeminence, how they're said. So those are the kinds of things. Uh, and uh, having read through the feedback about the first draft of our, our report and looked at the comments, uh, most of them have been very thoughtful and insightful, and they will improve the quality of our argument so that hopefully the the evidence is better and the argument is better, so that it will be more convincing to more people. Okay. And we will distribute it uh, for the Luma community also. There is a question coming from um, uh, how about people not interested on the f or feel lack of, of scientific literacy in s STEM subjects? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that's a good question. My response to that is that, in some senses, we all have lack of literacy in STEM subjects. I am not an expert on climate cha uh, change. I am not an expert on vaccines, okay, uh, in that sense. Uh, I am not uh, an expert on how to live an environmental li lifestyle. Uh, many of us, for instance, in the uh, uh, environmentally supportive lifestyle, many of us in the next five to ten years will make decisions about buying electric cars. Is buying an electric car a good thing? Uh, certain people are saying it is, but then what about all the issues with the batteries, those kinds of things? So I, in, if I've got those questions, and hopefully I think most of us are confronted with those questions in one way or another in our daily life, then what I'm g going to do is make uh, research the information that exists, and the obvious place I'm going to, to go and do that is on the internet. And then when I get these sources, I'm going to need to evaluate, should these sources be trusted? What's the nature of the scientific consensus about electric cars? Are these a good thing or not? And what are the reasons they're giving? Is anybody calling it into question? Who's calling it into question? So uh, the fact that I'm not particularly interested in STEM subjects, and to be quite honest, I think the way, I can't speak for Finland, obviously, but I can speak for the way a lot of it's taught across the globe, a lot of students are not particularly interested. 
uh, um, is neither really here nor there. What I want out of my science education is something that's of enduring value, that helps me to engage with science. And I am going to argue that some of the things that I'm putting forward, the development of these kinds of competencies, the development of this kind of knowledge, will help me when it comes to engaging uh, with, with science. Uh, and that, therefore, ultimately, is something, as a student, I would thank my science education for. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have time to move on. Yeah. And uh, thanks for Luma people for being here and join our streaming because now we are letting uh, Karita Keely from University of Tampere loose. Uh, she's telling about what critical does. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Van Kaikille. Ah, sorry, it was English. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Karita Kiri, and I'm from Tampere University, and I'm representing Critical Project. And uh, if I can get my slides. And our aim in Critical Project is educate uh, critical readers. And um, we are part of the um, literacy program which concerns information literacy and evidence-informed decision making and this program is uh, funded by strategic research council and uh, there are five uh, projects in this program and critical is one of them and uh, uh, finski is is the other one and uh, will be represented um, after after critical and in Critical, we have four teams representing Tampere University, University of Jyväskylä, University of Helsinki, and University of Oulu. And uh, Critical's research and interaction activities aim at supporting children and adolescents' uh, critical reading skills. And uh, throughout this schooling, and we hope that that uh, after, after the uh, school years, um, these critical reading skills can protect them from mis- and disinformation that is spreading online. And in our project, critical reading refers to analyzing, evaluating, and interpreting written and multimodal texts. So we recognize the var various, various uh, uh, types of, of texts. And uh, we investigate uh, students' critical reading skills and uh, we are also interested in what kind of, kinds of factors support these uh, skills. And our aim is also to develop and test research-based educational practices and digital learning materials for uh, critical reading education. But um, in addition to targeting for adolescents, we are also um, wanting to uh, develop teacher education because teachers are crucial uh, uh, educating our adolescents. So we are, for example, developing and te testing a teacher education course to prepare our forthcoming teachers to support their they students' critical reading development. And uh, finally, uh, we want to provide new knowledge and recommendations for policymakers and pract practitioners so that they can support uh, students' uh, critical reading. And um, our aims are actually well aligned with the national reading strategy that was announced uh, last month. And there are some issues that I have picked from the, from the strategy. So um, we should, uh, according to strategy, supporting reading uh, should be throughout uh, our lifespan. 
it supports uh, citizens' well-being, uh, our society's uh, equity and equality. And the strategy also recognizes the diversity of literacy environments and diversity of, of different types of texts, as well as the reading engagement. And the core concept in the strategy is multiliteracy, and it stems from the, our national uh, curriculum. And there are a lot of important goals in this national reading strategy. So we need, uh, as a society, a joint enterprise of different stakeholders uh, to, to uh, reach these uh, goals of the strategy. And for critical, it was very important that the strategy also recognizes the importance of critical reading. And here are some issues that uh, we are um, doing research in our, our project. We are interested how well students of different ages can evaluate the credibility of online texts and uh, also what kinds of home literacy practices supports uh, um, uh, children and adolescents' critical reading development, and uh, how gamification can support critical reading skills and uh, how the motivational factors are associated with the students' uh, reading skills. And we are also um, wanting to understand how well our students can evaluate uh, misleading uh, diagrams. Uh, actually, there is already a lot going on in our project. So there is uh, a glimpse uh, to ongoing research. At the moment, we are uh, doing data collection uh, to assess and understand uh, critical read, adolescents' critical reading skills, and particularly critical online reading skills and reading of crafts. And we are looking also how these home literacy practices are related to uh, students' performance. And we are using some uh, instruments that we have the uh, either developing or further developing in the program. And uh, for example, I have been developing this critical online reading assessment that I called uh, CORA. And it is designed to measure students' abilities to analyze and evaluate online texts that vary in their quality. And um, this is the CORA is an online environment where students read four uh, online texts. Uh, they are all the topics are health related, what we have now. For example, one topic is sugar effects. And we have manipulated different credibility aspects of the texts. For example, the uh, text genre. So we have a, a personal blog, newspaper article, popular science text, and commercial texts. And we have also manipulated author's expertise, author's benevolence, and quality of evidence in these uh, texts. And through these manipulations, uh, we can uh, assess uh, different skills. We can uh, understand how well students can identify the author, the main claim of the text, and the related evidence. How do they evaluate author's expertise, author's benevolence, and quality of evidence in, uh, with a six-point scale? <coughs> and then how do they justify their uh, evaluations? And we have a multiple choice uh, version, but then we have also another version where uh, also some open-ended uh, questions for students. And. Uh, we have already, um, in the previous project, already collected some data from uh, uh, sixth graders. And um, this uh, figure uh, illustrates the findings concerning students' evaluations of expertise, benevolence, and evidence that they rated with a six-point scale. And we tested four uh, different uh, 
uh, structures for sixth graders' credibility evaluation. And actually, the most complex uh, structure fitted best uh, to our data. And this structure is represented here. And what it tells us, it tells us that uh, somehow the text genre matters for students' evaluation. But most importantly, it shows that uh, sixth graders need to separate uh, latent skills when they are um, evaluating online information. They need a, a ability to confirm the credibility of more credible texts, and they need uh, an ability to question the less credible texts. And this questioning of less credible texts was much more difficult for sixth graders than confirming the credibility of, of uh, more credible texts. And the other instrument that we are currently have been developing in this project is critical graph uh, reading assessment. Uh, and we want to understand students' abilities to read and interpret, interpret graphs but also the abilities to identify misleading elements of the graphs. And these kind of misleading graphs are based on valid data, but the appearance of the graphs has been manipulated to distort the message of the graphs. So how well do, do students pay attention to these uh, elements where they can recognize these kind of uh, uh, misleading uh, purposes. And uh, I already told that we are now doing the data collection and we are uh, collecting data uh, from fourth graders, sixth graders, eighth graders and students who are first year uh, either in the upper secondary school or uh, vocational school. And we are using the same uh, text and uh, uh, multiple choice questions for across these age groups. And we want to want to understand how these uh, cross-sectionally, how these skills uh, develop across the grade levels. And our aim is to, uh, to uh, formulate recommendations uh, that are age appropriate for, for students. And that's that was uh, all for me now, and I'm looking forward to share some evidence uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Kirsi Pulkinen and I come from the Finnish Science Centre Association and I'm here to represent the Finski project. If I may have my slides please. While the slides are coming on, I will continue to, to mention that Finski stands for Fostering Finnish Science Capital and now from the first beginning, um, I would like to make it clear that we also are uh, funded by the Strategic Research Council in Finland, so in the same program as the project that Karita just presented. So when we are talking about Finski and science capital, this is a long-term project, of course, also comprising of a number of universities in Turku, Helsinki and Eastern Finland, and then Heureka and the Finnish Science Centre Association, which means 10 different science centres in different parts of the country. And also Skope, which is taking, part, taking care of our communication and interaction activities. But science capital, it's a term that many now hopefully have heard. Uh, it was coined in the UK context, so the meaning of science 
to begin with is slightly different from what it means in Finland and the Nordic countries. So when we talk about science capital in the Finsky project, we refer to all disciplines, not only STEM or the natural sciences, but every discipline and uh, all the differences and the variations that they include. So science capital is something that could mean a lot of different things. What we mean is a multitude of things that are all interconnected. So not only what a person knows, the, the actual content or substance of scientific knowledge and their science literacy as such, but also their trust in the abilities, the capabilities that they have to understand scientific knowledge. Secondly, it's not only about this knowledge, but how they think about that knowledge and the significance that science and science-related information has in their daily lives. So this is not only some abstract form of information in their lives, but something that they utilize in their everyday normal context, whether it is linked to how they think about health issues or education or, well, moving around in different ways. Thirdly, it is about what people do with this information and knowledge that they have. So how the scientific interests that they have actually formulates in their actual lives. Do they read uh, scientific information in different ways or listen to podcasts or go to science centers and so on? So how does it appear in normal daily routines? And fourthly, it's about who they know. Do people know researchers or medical doctors, teachers, other professionals who are trained in science in different ways? So the, the societal or social context that people have is very much related to the science knowledge and their skills, their attitudes towards science and the activities that take place in everyday lives. And also science capital has a direct link to the different opportunities and choices that we see on educational and career paths, including those choices we make in adult life. So in Finsky, our approach is not only the youth or adolescents and children, but we're talking about all age groups all throughout life. So why does Finsky exist then? As Karita also just mentioned, there is an abundance of information that is available but it is becoming more and more difficult to, to see which is trustworthy and which is not, and which can we follow and make decisions on, and which we should discard. As I mentioned, these are all related to normal everyday activities like our, our health choices or whether you should vaccinate or not. We make decisions based on the knowledge that we have. If our science capital is higher, we expect that people would then make these decisions based on research-based knowledge rather than something else. So the likelihood of being subjected to some kind of hoaxes or misinformation is lesser. And also at a societal level, the polarization of opinions and manipulation can be taken down somewhat. So a, a more uh, comfortable society based on research-based knowledge for all of us. Now, this also means that science capital has a direct link to equity and the social access that we have to knowledge. We know from previous research that this is not the case. We do not have the same approaches or the same possibilities to access scientific information, even if we all go to the same schooling systems and so on. So we need to be able to look at these things both in formal education as well as the informal learning context that follow us throughout our lifetime. In Finsky, we have a scientific vision that is, of course, to produce new knowledge about scientific thinking and how science capital is fostered and accumulated, but also to evaluate how this knowledge can be applied in different kinds of contexts. So to do this, we combine different theoretical and disciplinary approaches. So I would even say we go beyond the multidisciplinary and to transdisciplinary approaches and develop research methods uh, on this basis. 
But a very important part of the scientific work is also to engage those who could benefit from research. And this is done in a very co-creative manner in different ways. So we work in direct collaboration with different sorts of people and groups and communities, especially focusing on those who do not currently have access or have lesser access to scientific knowledge. So our areas of research are rather broad. The people in the University of Turku are looking at the emotions in knowledge acquisition, as well as future citizen science literacy and everyday decision making. At the University of Helsinki, there are colleagues looking at the neurocognitive processes in decision making. The University of Eastern Finland are looking at parent science capital and how this is related to children's science literacy. At the science centers, um, we look at the democratization of science and in particular the informal science learning context. And then of course we have a specific part on engagement and interaction with, with the population. Our societal vision is of course directly li linked to this but somewhat different in how we, how we work with it. So we're talking about enhancing the interest and trust towards science and doing this direct, in direct collaboration with the people whose interests and trusts we hope to influence. These are people from all walks of life in different age groups and different parts of society. We're looking at enhancing possibilities to use scientific knowledge in decision making and this is both at the normal everyday level of all of us, but also in public decision making at the top of society. And then the ability to evaluate the reliability of information, which my colleague Karita just uh, discussed, so I will not go more deeply into that. So we're doing both research and development. Uh, we're very intrigued to know how the different, the four uh, branches of science capital actually function in relation to themselves, um, what the dynamics are. We know that they are linked, but how their subcomponents actually link, that is not yet known. So this is what we're trying to both understand and then develop into uh, work practices and so on. Our collaboration is through multiple channels, of course, with the, within the consortium and with Finnish residents of all sorts, and in partnerships with, for example, civil society organizations or um, and other types of public organizations that work, work in relation to these different sectors. And as I mentioned, again, this collaboration pays specific attention to those whose, whose access to science and the world of science around it is limited for different reasons. So we're trying to find the unseen hinders and take them down. Now, when it comes to the science centers, we have our own work package, as you noticed, but uh, our, our part in the research development uh, activities is a bit specific. We run different types of experiments and they are based on an idea of cyclical evaluation and co-creation. So when we work with, for example, youth, we are currently running experiments with youth. They are not only taking part in different experiments, but they also get to evaluate how it works and give us some further ideas on how we should do things better, what works, what doesn't work. And then we build these into pilots that they again come to evaluate. And in this double diamond way of working, we can utilize the lessons we learned throughout the entire project. So what we learn with the youth it, it hopefully can be utilized to work with people um, in, in the elderly um, part of populations. So it's to develop new practices and work methods, to build new partnerships that we may not see at the moment, but that could really push the idea of Finsky forward. And to scale these tools so that they can be adapted to different kinds of contexts and environments, and then used openly and shared openly with anyone working within the field. So it's very much about cross-organizational learning for all of us. So in short, it's about a change of perspective. 
currently we know that there's an overemphasis on the interests of the socioeconomically advantaged and highly educated people. And we want to move beyond this to identify the obstacles that hinder other people, different sorts of minorities, for example, from accessing the world of science. So we would get more diversity and again, um, a stronger science capital also at a societal level. So we're talking about individual as well as shared capital. And moving from the traditional view of science centers or researchers and experts, somewhat top down, what do we want the audiences to understand? We move to a new way of looking at the view of multiple types of audiences. So not only the current ones, but in particular those who are now excluded. So what is important to them? What is meaningful to them in substance and in the ways that we work with them? So it's a bottom up process, bottom up and then back again and stressing the, the importance of participation and co-creation and less talk about target groups and rather about the people being active actors in themselves. Now, if you'd be interested in participating, we have a lot, lot, lot of different channels to do that. Here are some of them. And much of this information is placed on our website, which you see at the bottom of the page. So you're very welcome to follow us and be part of this project in different ways and take make contact with us. We're also on social media. You can find all of the different channels of finding us. So you, we'd be happy to see you come involved in our project. Thank you. I have the task to moderate the question and answers part. And it's a relatively easy task because we kind of failed to send a link uh, for the questions. But it doesn't mean that we don't answer to your questions. Um, you have been hearing and seeing um, different type of presentations this afternoon. We all, different groups, Let's say we started by a fact-checking organization who has decided to do uh, media and information literacy. We learned about the digital information literacy. We heard the importance of the science education by Professor Jonathan Osborne. We have um, learned the, that there is a new critical group studying uh, the reading skills and online reading capacities of our, our children in the schools. And yes, at the last, uh, we had a, a Finsky group telling about what they do. And in fact, we all speak same language. We are speaking about same approach, but let's say from the different angles. And I have to say that this is a blessing to, to do work in this field in Finland. We have different organizations, NGOs, project groups, universities, and we can work together because we feel that this is a hugely important issue. And instead of um, spending one Friday afternoon time for questions and answers, I will invite um, Mikko Salo, the founder of the Fakta Party, to come and wrap up the session. On my behalf, I thank you all and especially Heureka and the technicians of Heureka for excellent work. And you can find these um, recordings later on and Mikko will explain how. Thank you and I wish you a good weekend. So, hello again, and um, 
it pretty much leaves after quite an exclusive setting to to thank people and to advise on the following steps, and especially the ones that Kari mentioned on the on where you can find this recording, for example. So this is faktavari.fi slash edu, and there you got all our materials. You can also follow us on fuck at faktavari or in English at factbar. Um, that's where we are going soon after this one as well. Um, I would then still refer to the to the uh, to the richness of the, the debates, and I came up to the idea that basically, based on these either individual contributions or joining the contribution, as we have heard it, you are very happy to organize your own fakta bar, so invite some, uh, let's say, like-minded, or not necessarily like-minded, but a group of people and, and, and debate about these ones. There is nothing absolute truth, so to say, but uh, this kind of different try type of uh, approaches where we try to try to make sense of the, the reality as we see it at the moment. So I think this recording that you can find on our website immediately after the, the, the setting might serve as a, as a kind of catalyze for that one. Uh, this said, I will also very much personally uh, and, and uh, probably join with you, start waiting for the final report of the Teaching Critical and Evaluative Thinking in Science. So Jonathan's led a group for their contributions, because I believe that will be a very important contribution for the, for the, the, the even let's say, on the global level. As we heard, it's like something like three to four months, but we will announce it, of course, and I mean they will all announce on their, their respective channels at that stage. Finally, just very much thank you to, of course, Jonathan as our very honored special guest, our Finnish fellow literacy uh, colleagues and, and, and friends, uh, all of you, of course, there behind the, 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 the screen. Thank you for your patience on Friday evening, uh, and um, and naturally, of course, very much to Heureka, who has been very kindly hosting us with with wonderful technological help and technical help, and um, and finally, then the U.S. Embassy for making possible to invite Jonathan to address us here from Finland, but for the for the let's say global audience as such. Um, with this, I just um, wish you a very nice weekend and uh, join our fact-based Faktabari movement. Cheers. <laughs>